Good morning. My name is Jackie Anderson, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, the University of St. Thomas and our summer online learning series. Uh, the purpose of each one of these sessions is to give you the opportunity to start your day with a dose of learning while giving us the opportunity to showcase some of the great faculty that teach here within executive education. And we do that all by the time you get your first cup of coffee. Now this is the second in a series of three programs. Our next session is titled Polarities and is scheduled for Tuesday, August 20th with our thought leader, Peter Krems. If you haven't registered, take a few minutes, to check out the website and consider joining. What you may not know is the University of St. Thomas actually offers over 30 open enrollment programs. And those programs go from deep specializations such as a project management certificate, a black belt certificate, all the way to uh, leading edge leadership programs. As a matter of fact, we are taking applications right now for our second cohort of the St. Thomas Executive Program, our STEP program. It's a nine day program that is offered in the fall for director level and above. If you're interested, again, check out the website. We also have two new programs coming online this fall. One is around design thinking, and you'll get a great flavor of that today uh, with our online learning series, as well as another uh, program titled Decision Making and Execution with thought leader Leo Hoff. We'd love to see you here at University of St. Thomas. So with that, let me give you the plan for this morning. Um, I'm going to introduce John McVeigh in just a minute, and he's going to spend about 45 minutes really setting up the context around design thinking. We're going to try to save time at the end for questions, but because of the large number of participants today, we're asking that you submit your questions using the chat feature in the Zoom application, and we'll read back some of those questions at the end as time permits. Um, so if there is no more further ado, it's my pleasure then to introduce today's faculty. Uh, we have Professor John McVeigh joining us. John is a professor in the School of Entrepreneurship and his research is really focused around strategic thinking, innovation, and decision making. Uh, he's a native of Northern Ireland and has worked extensively in the Americas and Europe. And prior to joining academia, he was a consultant with Bain and Company. Um, he has a degree in engineering, in economics, and he has his PhD in management from the Darden School at the University of Virginia. I can promise you a great session. It's my pleasure to welcome John McVeigh. Thank you, Jackie. Good morning. Um, I've already got my first cup of tea this morning, not coffee, um, so welcome. Uh, this is what I sort of call a little crash course in design thinking. So let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, as Jackie has said, um, I'm originally from the north of Ireland, so there's some remnants of my, uh, my quirky accent left. Um, I worked in industry for about 20 years before I came back to academia uh, for DuPont and Company in operations, and then as Jackie said, for Bain and Company in Boston, uh, Mitt Romney's old firm working in strategy consultant. So I've been at St. Thomas for about 15 years now, and I teach strategy, I teach innovation, and I teach um, design thinking. And I'm, I'm really excited to do this online. I love to teach face-to-face, -face, uh, and uh, it's frustrating. I can't talk to you guys face-to-face, -face -face, but it's great to hear we have 500 people online, which is, we're overwhelmed by the demand. Uh, and as Jackie says, I'm doing some hands-on face-to-face courses in this in, in the fall. So, you know, sign up early. And as they say in Ireland about voting, vote early, vote often. So uh, it, it, I, as you see, our classrooms probably take about 30 people. So since if there's 500 of you online, I would suggest if you, if you find this interesting, sign up. I'd love to run as many sessions as we can. So um, let me get on to um, our, our topic of the day, day design thinking. Um, that's the official title. I hope today we cover something that, um, Something else that we don't talk so much uh, about in business, um, uh, but probably something that brought many of us to business in the first place. And, and that's the topic is joy. See this wee girl here? Uh, how many of you remember what it felt like? Running down in the summer, full of life, your senses turned up full, just in full flow of life. That's how many of us, that's how I came into business, that's how I came into my career, right? And how many of us a few years later, we don't get that feeling every day. We get it sometimes, but we get jaded from, you know, too many meetings that have no agenda or no purpose, 
systems that sort of deaden the soul, and most particularly problems that never get solved. Those annoying problems that we just learn to live with and tolerate around our businesses, our customers. What I think human-centered design can do, it can actually bring that joy back. High design thinking, it can reignite the joy in your work, your collaboration with your colleagues, and most importantly, it can get results and attention. Uh, and if that sounds like a lot of hyperbola, I want to share this because it actually happened to me. Um, I used to teach this, you know, just as another topic in strategy, a useful tool set. Uh, and what I discovered when I actually started implementing this and working on some real assignments in the field, that this really could change how I felt about doing my job and how I felt about the role of, of strategy in business. And it also had the ability to really transform people's careers. And that's what I hope to give you a window into, how these tools, not only they can get better results, but it really can transform your career if you want to use it in that way. So um, let's talk a little bit about my agenda. The, the sands of time are, are, are ticking already and we're gonna start off by talking a little bit about what is design thinking and what it's not. Um, this is a short introduction, um, but I really wanna get clear what, what it is and what it can offer us. I wanna share a little with you why I fell in love with these set of tools and techniques and why it's really changed uh, the way I do my job. Um, we're going to dig in a little bit, bit deeper with five counterintuitive rules of innovation and, and human-centered design that this topic brings. Um, and then at the end, I want to talk a little bit, as I just mentioned, how it can change your career and how you can learn more. Now, word of warning, design thinking, human-centered design, these are essentially the same thing. And so I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably, and there's a reason for that. They actually give two different aspects, two important aspects to the topic. So please be prepared. Sometimes I'll be calling it human-centered design. Sometimes I'll be calling it design thinking. Those are essentially the same, the same thing. So sometimes we understand what a thing is really by starting off with what it's not. And once we mention the word design, People get in their, you know, in our mind's eye, this idea of IKEA furniture or these funky office chairs that look really cool but actually really aren't very comfortable. Um, and what human-centered design is not, it's not just about designing se sexy objects like this fantastic uh, orange squeezer by Philip Stark. Now, as soon as I started, started you, you know, using this as an example, I realized I really want one of these. It is beautifully designed. It actually works. Um, but that's not really what human-centered design is about today. It started as a design methodology, right? And it started off as a way of designing beautiful objects, I guess. And it really grew in Silicon Valley around companies like Apple and IDEO, really in the high-tech industry about designing products that worked better and also were aesthetically beautiful. But it turns out they happened to trip over a way of thinking and a way of approaching problems that was way more widely applicable. And Today, it's not really just about designing products that are beautiful. It's actually about solving problems, human problems, and it can be used widely. Uh, you know, Procter & Gamble brought it into their environment and designed the Swiffer. We've got, uh, you know, 3M uses the product. It's used in education. It's increasingly being used in healthcare, and it's just being used to solve day-to-day -day tasks, and that's the way it can really transform how we do things and how we interact with people in our, in our work environments. It's also not just about solving problems. And this is critical. It's actually about solving things for people who have problems. So human-centered design has the word human at the start for a reason. It puts people right in the middle of what we're trying to do at work. So marketing taught us a few years ago, famously at Harvard Business School, they would say, don't sell the drill, sell the hole. Don't sell products, sell solutions, right? Human-centered design goes one stage further. And that she says, we're not trying to actually make a better hole. We're, try we're not trying to focus on the hole at all or the drill. We're trying to focus on Jackie, the person who thinks she has need of a hole in the wall, right? But when you use human-centered design, what we actually do is we don't take that as red. We go and talk to Jackie. We observe her in her day-to-day -day tasks. We listen to her and we discover she doesn't actually need a hole. She wants a hole, but what she needs is a way to hang up pictures 
that's flexible, doesn't need tools, and is adjustable. And by interacting with her and observing her and understanding her, we end up designing the 3M control strip picture hangers. Now that's important because it's a really neat solution for a problem, but think about why it's important to you, the leader who's trying to come up with these solutions. If we were really trying to make a better drill, what would we need to focus our skills on? We'd have to understand, you know, gears, electric motors, injection molding, assembly techniques to make better drills. If we were really focused on making better holes, what would we have to focus on as leader? We'd have to focus on cutting tools and on polycarbonate diamond tips and on cooling techniques for the, for the drill bit. But if we're really focused on Jackie and her problem, what skills and competencies do we need? We need some things that we don't really talk about a lot in business. We need empathy, not technical skills. And so we bring in this vocabulary of terms, you know, empathy, compassion, hearing, listening, feelings, all the things we rarely talk about at work. And we need to do two things that we, again, really have forgotten how to do at work. We need to stop and listen, and we need to open up our hearts to understand other people. Now, for, I'm an engineer, so I can say this, for the engineers and the accountants in the room, don't worry, you only have to open your heart for a short period of time. You don't have to do it for your whole life. But we do have to open our hearts to try and understand truly who are the people who have got the problems we're trying to serve, because only that way can we truly come up with an innovative solution for them. So it puts the human right in the center of human-centered design. And you see here on the left, we've got this very technically rational person who's well-trained. Jackie has worked for years uh, getting her technical skills, her professional skills. She's logical, rational, and organized, right? And unfortunately, when she wants to start to do human-centered design, temporarily, she needs to take that all out and put it on the shelf. All that experience, all that knowledge, all that technical expertise needs to go on the shelf. And with a blank sheet of paper, we need to learn the skills to go to our person, our customer, our user, and understand truly where they're coming from, how they feel, what they need, what they want. And that's a mind shift for us. Turns out, it's a really enriching mindset, and it's a much more enjoyable um, way to do our work. Now, having opened up what will delight some of you and horrify others, that perhaps business strategy and innovation is all touchy-feely and about emotions, the beautiful thing about human-centered design, it ultimately was designed by a lot of engineers and designers, and it still, at the same time, remains a structured, replicable process. So we need to open our minds and our hearts to things like empathy, but this is a structured, replicable process that we go through to generate better results. It's not just hocus pocus, it's not just emotion. So let me start a little bit about when I tell you a story of how I fell in love before we go into the deep dive of some of the techniques, how I fell in love with this technique. And so you'll see the little logo on the left. That's for it's CMC Hospital in Minneapolis, or now called Hennepin Healthcare. And so um, I started after you know, teaching this for a number of years, came across an assignment and working with um, HCMC, tried to use these techniques and it really changed my perspective on human-centered design and actually doing it. So what's unfortunate about doing this online, this truly is a technique where you really only understand it when you start to do it face-to-face, hands-on, um, and you get a feeling of how transformative it is. So I hope to give you a little flavor of that. HCMC is a hospital. It's actually a safety net hospital, so large safety net hospital in the middle of an urban area. I'm sure many of you know uh, and are familiar with it. And one of its problems is a lot of its, or one of its challenges, and indeed its mission, is that it serves a lot of uninsured and vulnerable groups. So a lot of mental health issues, a lot of unstable homes, a lot of homeless people. And ultimately, it's a safety net, and they go there for treatment, and they may or may not have coverage. And one of the biggest costs that a hospital like this has are no-show appointments. Why so? Because the hospitals generate their revenue by, for, for a lot of these patients from Medicare and Medicaid. And if they actually set aside time and the, the window for these appointments and they don't turn up, they can't bill. And so it's a huge, multi, multi-million dollar problem for HCMC. 
And so what do you do when you've got a problem? We're in an organization, we've got the big problem, I guess we do what we always do. We get all the experts together in the boardroom, bring in all the people who think they know everything, all the most experienced, they get in the boardroom with their clipboard, and we sit around the table and say, we've got the smart people in the room, let's solve the problem. And they do, you know that movie, you know, called The Usual Suspects? We do the same thing in our committees and our, our meetings. We conclude the usual suspects. What could we do about this? We could cut costs. We could plan around appointment redundancy, just get used to it. My favorite, you know, keep your head down and hope the problem goes away. We do a lot of it. Even worse, we could decide, let's hold an offsite. <laughs> We've all been uh, involved in those and how effective those are. And guess what, a few years later, it's operating at the same rate of no-shows as it was 20 years ago. No difference. One of these problems that people just stop talking about because we never get to the bottom of. So what did they do? They took a very brave solution. Um, they decided to apply some human-centered design. And so what they did was one of the mantras of human-centered design. I want you to write this down at home. Take out your pen and piece of paper, write it down. And when you get to your conference room, write it big and stick it on the wall. That's what IDEA does. The answer is not in the room. If you truly want an innovative solution, the answer is not in the room. The answer is out there. What's in the room is historical expertise, historical data, historical not knowledge. We need to get out of that room. So write it on your walls, tattoo it on your forehead, every pointless meeting you're sitting through, the answer is not in the room. So they formed Upstream Healthcare Innovations, a separate group. They applied design thinking. They trained the senior team. It's really quick and reasonably cheap. Two-day course, perfectly adequate. And then the beauty of, the, of human centered design is there's so many resources, we'll mention at the end, available on the internet, that that leadership team can then train their own team themselves. You don't need to bring in consultants. You don't need to spend huge amounts of money. That team then went out and actually studied this vulnerable population themselves. So they went out and they did open-ended, empathetic interviews. They talked to them about their lives, about their needs. They didn't talk to them directly about missing appointments. They just did a day in the life study, tried to understand what challenges these people faced, what was top of their mind. They did simple things like they rode the bus with them. They didn't ask them about their bus, right? They rode the bus. And they came up with some, what they call in healthcare, upstream determinants of health. Things that actually predate being sick or coming or missing an appointment. And one of these, just one they checked off early on, was transportation. Unsurprisingly, transportation was one of the reasons people in vulnerable populations, a lot of these, as I said, with mental health issues, some who are very scared of authority figures uh, and of institutional um, uh, sort of organizations like transportation organizations, and transportation was a huge issue for them. So, is this just a fun way, because it's more fun to do the work, to get out of the conference room and go and hang out with these people and with your customer and ride the bus? No, it's important because it also changes the answer. So what did they do? They visited the patients at home, sometimes many of them being homeless, they visited them on the park bench. That led to identifying fear as a fundamental criteria amongst these users. They were afraid of authority figures. They were afraid of getting messages from in the mail. They were afraid that it might be from immigration services. They were afraid it might be from legal authorities. They're confused when they try to use buses. Taxis, it turned out, one of the big learnings, taxis treat them with great hostility. Traditional taxis didn't want to pick them up, and when they did pick them up, were unpleasant. That led to the idea of let's experiment with rideshare. So they formed an agreement with Lyft and said, let's try with Lyft. What if we were able to send a Lyft to these people? Well, that would lead to how would we do that when they're being discharged? Well, that was the challenge of synchronizing the ordering of a Lyft with the electronic health record. So there was a technical problem that they developed, which led to the question, well, how do they then, it's ordered, persuade these people to get into this Lyft since they're already nervous of buses and taxis? Well, this is a great example of the level of detail sometimes involved in human-centered design. They experimented with the exact wording of the text messages. It took 38 different wordings and experimentations to find the right text message that was reassuring, was not threatening, that, did, that used their name, 
that was open hearted, that didn't make the people immediately ignore the text and think, oh, this is a trap by immigration or this is a trap by uh, law enforcement. So they found the right wording to send a text to these people that a lift, a free lift has been arranged for your appointment. They formed a separate company, Hitch Health, and they ran the experiment. 25% drop in no-shows in the cancer treatment area and the health, uh, mental health area that they were using. And for every dollar that was spent by Hennepin Healthcare on this free transportation service, it saved them $11. Incredible, we don't have to be in a finance class to know what the ROI is on, on, on that. Turns out, this is a $150 billion opportunity across the country in all safety net hospitals, and indeed in a lot of other for-profit and non-profit hospitals. Hitch Health has now been formed as a separate entity. It has now raised private funding, and it is now rolling itself off as a solution across the country. Now, I think where this came from, originally, this was just a problem that if we treated in the normal fashion, it would just have all the usual experts sitting in the room saying, we gotta cut our costs, we gotta cut our overhead because of, these, because of the cost of no-shows. And in instead, when we actually go out and say, the answer is not in the room, we need to suspend all our assumptions, suspend our expertise, and go out and actually spend time trying to empathize with the people who have a problem, what looked like a cost issue turns out to be a huge opportunity for revenue and growth. That's the sort of excitement that human-centered design can bring. But even more so, what I want to get across, what I hope to get across to you is the transformation it made in the careers of the people involved. The people involved don't even work for HCMC anymore. They're separate in a startup. Uh, they're running around the country getting, getting investment and private equity investment. They love their jobs. They're excited about the impact they're having on the indigent and the homeless. And they're also excited about their jobs. And also the day-to-day the, the -day tasks they do are just enjoyable and have purpose. So that's the sort of impact I think human-centered can design um, can have. And it certainly had on me when and to the extent I get involved with these assignments, um, engagements directly. So what have we done so far? Hopefully we've said a little bit about what human-centered design is and is not. Um, and hopefully set the scene and giving you a story, an example of why I think it really is important and the impact it can have. So we, for a few minutes, let me just give you a little bit deeper dive into five counterintuitive rules of design thinking. We don't have time to go into the absolute nitty gritty of all of the tools and techniques. We have to really have people face to face and do hands on training for that. Um, but these five counterintuitive rules are really important. Because you know, anything that's counterintuitive has a have much greater chance of bringing innovation and bringing something that's unexpected. And so we often say, what is the purpose of human-centered design? And I always come back to the people I'm advising and say, there's only one sole purpose. The overall purpose of human-centered design um, uh, assignment is to find surprises. If you're actually using your marketing research or your, design, or your product development research to confirm the things you already know, and this is confirm the things your customers already know, you're completely wasting your dollars because you already know that. The only purpose in doing this is if you're truly interested in surprises. So if you're in an organization or you're, uh, that's not really interested in surprises and changing the way they do things, then this would be a waste of time. But if you're that little bird sitting on the other end of the wire, human-centered design can bring some real huge insights. So the first counterintuitive, approach or, or insight that human-centered design brings is around the customer. Rule number one, if you wish to delight your customers or users with, with a true innovation, don't ask them what they want. Now that sounds pretty strange and it goes back to, you'll wonder why I've got a horse on here, it goes back to uh, Henry Ford. And Henry Ford had this insight, so it's not all new. Henry Ford famously said, if I'd listened to my customers, I would have built a faster horse. But of course he didn't. This is the faster horse he built. The worst thing we can do, if we're truly interested in using human-centered design and in the innovating, is to send our existing knowledgeable people out to talk to our existing customers and ask them what they want instead of what they need. 
I can guarantee you and save you a lot of money. If you want to send your existing salespeople to talk to your existing customers and ask them what they want, I can tell you what they'll tell you. They'll tell you they want the same thing you're giving me cheaper. That's what everybody says in every industry, in every market. If you ask them what they want, they want what they're getting and they want it cheaper. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they need. Because the truth is, and you know, Steve Jobs was, uh, a, had a, you know, a huge insight on this. We can't expect our customers to even be able to imagine what they need because they don't even understand what they could have. That's our job. So there's a mistake to make here where people talk a little bit about customer-led design as if this means hand over the reins to the customers. Like University of St. Thomas would say to our students, you design the curriculum, we'll teach whatever you want. That is not human-centered design. I don't know what that is, but it's sort of suicide. What you don't want to do is hand over to the customer, but it is customer-inspired design. By truly understanding those students and empathizing with those students, we can then use our expertise to design something they've never dreamt of that they actually need and then bring in innovation. So don't ask them what they want. Go and spend time with them. And then it's our job to use these tools and techniques we learn to figure out what they need. Our goal, therefore, is really to articulate or to, 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 unsur or to surface, excuse me, the, the, the needs that our customers can't even articulate. So really their needs are really, they run from the explicit to the tacit, which means silent, right? They're, they're not prepared to tell us initially, or even the latent needs. And latent needs are ones that they're not even aware of. They can't even express themselves. And in order to get explicit needs, we just ask them what they think and they'll tell us. To get to the tacit needs, we have to actually observe and engage with them, right? And we saw a little bit of that in the HCMC case. We have to go along and watch them check into a, uh, into a clinic and observe them. But in order to get to the latent needs, the ones that they're not even aware of, we need to actually make something for them and give them an experience so that they can believe, feel, and dream what they haven't imagined before. So, we've actually got a little demonstration, even though we're online, and I would like Jackie to come forward. And what we've got here is, we have to imagine, this is, this, this is a measuring jar, if you bring this table across a little bit. And um, place it here, and we're, we're gonna imagine Jackie's doing something very dangerous. Let's imagine this is nitroglycerine or something. I'm not sure why she's putting nitroglycerine in a, in, in a measuring jug, but she's making some very high skilled uh, explosive device. So if she gets it wrong, this could be a disaster. And I would like uh, Jackie to fill exactly one cup into this jug, pour it in, and it's gotta be exact. And watch her and observe her as she does this. It's gotta be exact. She's taking this very seriously, obviously, down on her, on her hands and knees. Coming up with this, you may be familiar if you've been trying to make a, a souffle in your kitchen. I know I can't make souffles no matter how carefully I uh, measure, but are you confident? That's it? Excellent. So this is what people have to do this technique. Now, if we went and interviewed them and said, what could I do to improve this? And the company did that. It turns out what they said is, well, you could make it lighter, you could make it cheaper, but I'm pretty happy with it, right? I've, I can do this pretty accurately because I've worked out how to do it. And Jackie getting down, and you saw, we sometimes call this the measuring dance, you know, up and down, down on her knees, doing this. That's what we call in business sometimes a, a workaround. So they've come up with a workaround and they're happy with it. And we could survey Jackie till the cows come home and she'll say, I'm pretty happy with it. It'd be great if you could get me 10% off. But another company did the opposite. They decided, instead of asking her, to watch her. And so I'm gonna ask Jackie to come back. And if we go to, I'll go to my next slide so that you can see this. Where did I left my from? Oh.
Could I show the one beside? Thank you. There's the standard measuring cup. This company you're probably familiar with, great design company, OXO, designs this jug with an inclined measuring scale on it. Now if we watch Jackie fill exactly one cup, she can stand up. Her eye line is perfect for this. She doesn't have to worry about getting her eyes level with the scale as it fills up. She fills it up, it's perfect, it's faster, it's more effective. Thank you, Jackie. Perfect, we didn't explode. Now, this is a lovely piece of design. I'm sure many of you have these at home. Forgive me, going off screen a sec. Here's one of the interesting things. Where do you think these two plastic um, jugs are made? Probably in China, probably injection molding. How much plastic do you think's in this? I would say maybe 50 cents little bit of overhead, I don't know, maybe it comes the wholesale price of $1.50. What is this sold for, this standard one? It's sold for about six bucks. So with margin, you've maybe got like a, I don't know, $2 margin on this jug. This jug, what does this sell for? About 11 bucks. What's the cost? probably exactly the same. There's a little bit more design and that's amortized over what, a million products? Maybe it's a cent of extra design. Same amount of plastic, same injection molding, same transportation costs, $11. It's got like something like four times the margin. What's the only difference between these two jugs? The only difference between these two jugs is an idea. And the only way we got the idea was by observing and spending time with the user and finding a way to delight them that they hadn't even imagined, by finding a need that they were not even aware of. That is an example of how focusing on latent and tacit needs and going and observing and spending time with our customers and our users can actually bring us these great insights. So we don't ask them what they want, we go watch them and figure out what they need. Rule number two, there's a popular cultural myth that people who are creative are different sort of people, right? There's some people just born creative. I do this when I teach some of my undergrads and we do some exercises and some students put their hand up, you know, I'm just not a creative person. This is a terribly damaging myth and it's reinforced by our institutions, by organizations we work for, um, the truth is we're all capable of bringing innovation to fruition because all human beings are creative. And I don't have to just say this as a matter of belief. We've got the facts. <laughs> We've got a study. A guy called Land many years ago did a study and he took a bunch of five-year-olds and he followed them at five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, and as adults. And he gave them a NASA creativity test. And this test, not just a symbolic test, tested how creative you were at five years old, at 10 years old, at 15 years old, and as an adult. So how many, write down, take out your pen, and tell me how many people you think at five years old passed the creativity test, the NASA creativity test? Someone in this room, how many, how many, how many, how many, Brian, how many people do you think passed the NASA creativity test at five? Ninety-eight percent. Ninety-eight percent. We're born really creative. So then we send them off to school, right? So we're going to make it more creative. We're going to really reinforce this, you know, playing with blocks and doing painting. And at ten years old, how many people pass the creativity test? Ooh, thirty percent. Now, as a long-time teacher. My parents were teachers. My mother's a teacher. My grandparents a teacher. This should horrify us, right? They go off to elementary school and, and the percentage of creativity falls. So then we send them off to high school, big ideas, right? Really complicated things. We'll make them much more creative there, not just you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. How many at 15? 12%. How many people at adults pass the NASA creativity test? 2%. 
So for the pessimists among us, we go, oh God, this is hopeless. We ought to end the course now because this is just hopeless. We, human, it turns out we're not creative. Land is my hero because his conclusion from this marks him as one of the most optimistic people and ins inspiring people because what he concluded and what we should conclude from this test is non-creative behavior is learned. We're born creative and we learn to be uncreative. And that should inspire us because if we can learn to be uncreative, presumably we can unlearn. It's our natural way of being. And that brings us back to this idea of joy. It's how we were built. We're built to solve problems. We're built to be creative. We're built to play. So we need to ask ourselves, what is it that gets in the way of our creativity? How many people think they're really creative in their jobs? What are the blockages that get between you and creativity? This is a commute to work in Ireland, by the way. So, but it's the, the idea of what's getting between this car and, and where it's trying to get to and create creatively. Um, again, write down a couple of things. There are at least three or four factors that consistently come up in getting in the way of creativity. So have a think for a minute. Why aren't you as creative as that little girl we saw at the start of this? Okay, I'll hazard a guess. One of the reasons is fear, fear of failure, fear of getting it wrong, fear of making a fool of yourself. What also happens is institutions, right? Authority figures, your boss, the organizational structure. Another thing that gets in the way of creativity, incentives, what we're actually encouraged to do, what we're paid, how we're measured, right? There's a lot of things that get in the way of us being creative. But what I'd love most of you to remember is the biggest one of those is fear. Fear of standing out from the crowd and of getting it wrong publicly. If I teach and I suddenly say, and we're doing a case study, and I'm asking the students to prepare and come in with their ideas, and first moment of the class, I say, who's got an idea of what the company should do in this case? And Brian puts his hand up and says, I think they should open another factory. And I, as the instructor, go, oh, for goodness sake, did you even read the case? That is a dumb idea, right? Now, who else has got an idea? How many people are going to put up their hand? No one. But how many times do we do that in meetings? How many times does the authority figure at the start of the meeting, you know, say, oh, we did that before. Oh, that never worked. Don't be ridiculous. Once we've set that tone, it sends a signal to everyone else, don't take that risk. Because it is a very, very high risk thing to ask your people to actually come up with an original idea. So we need to create atmospheres of trust. We need to make, create atmospheres within this methodology where people can be lighthearted, people joke, people can make mistakes, people can uh, fool around because that's the only way they're gonna have the courage to actually um, throw out a crazy idea that might lead us to a new solution. Rule number three, creativity. This beautiful picture, you know, we think of it's inspiration and it's, it's all about breaking the rules and, you know, crazy people going off like Picasso and doing what comes from their soul. But what we need to remember is it also needs to be structured. And we mentioned this earlier before. So think of the arts. And my wife worked in the arts. She's the Associate Dean of Entrepreneurship here at the Schultz School. And she worked in the arts for many years. And she will always tell me, I get very, very frustrated that people treat the arts as some lighthearted thing where people can just follow their dreams and be inspirational. The reason why the pianist can improvise wonderfully is because they spent years doing scales. The reason the ballerina can float across the stage looking effortless is because she practiced until her feet bled, right? The reason Picasso broke all the rules and came up with those crazy paintings that my kids go, I could paint that, <laughs> is that if you look in his youth, he practiced the traditional arts until he perfected them of how you draw portraits in, in, in a structured manner. So even in the arts everywhere, it is this beautiful yin and yang of inspiration, empathy, 
breaking the rules, but following a structured process. So human-centered design actually has this process. And this is what we would go through in, a, in more depth on a, on a, on a hands-on course. There were really five stages. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And there are a bunch of different tools and techniques that we learn in each of these stages. So to empathize, we need to learn the techniques of open-ended interviewing. Turns out that's really hard. And there's some really concrete rules and disciplines we have to learn to follow if we're to do open-ended interviewing well. In the define stage, we need to learn how to analyze unstructured data, qualitative data, not just quantitative. So we have to learn those techniques of extracting meaning from, from um, transcripts, from comments. And again, there's a very structured methodology for learning to do that, that converges us in on some definitions. Then we need to ideate. And we need to learn that brainstorming is not just a phrase. There's a discipline to brainstorming. And there are rules to brainstorming. And if you don't follow the rules to brainstorming, you get what I call full brainstorming. How many people turn up to meetings in their boardroom and all the senior leaders are brought around a table and the senior leader stands and says, I'm really interested in new ideas. Throw out your new ideas for how we solve this problem. And what happens is a giant game of everyone in the room trying to guess the answer that the leader came into the room with in the first place. And the person who guesses what was in the leader's idea or in the leader's head first place gets a promotion. It was sycophant of the year or something. That's full brainstorming. Real brainstorming is collaborative. We're not allowed to say not. We're not allowed to criticize other ideas. We need to be disciplined. We build on the ideas of others and we genuinely approach it with a, a clean slate. And those are tools and techniques that can be taught. Then we come to probably one of the most critical stages of human-centered design, prototyping. And these are not the prototypes, as we'll see in a few minutes, that you see in the Detroit Motor Show, where they look perfect. These are quick and dirty, as one of the founders of IDEO calls them, crappy prototypes. Crappy prototypes that you get quickly into the hands of the user so they criticize it and so they tell you how to improve it. Rule four. You can't plan your way to great innovation. Just because there's a process does not mean this is about planning. What we need to do is a great deal of trial and error. Managers are really good at planning plans out of old data, and creating business plans. That's a bit like trying to drive your car only looking through your rear view mirror. What we need is new data about what's changing and about the future, and you can't get that just by recycling old data. So we end up with all these pointless questions about who's the customer, how big's the opportunity, what's their investment required, what's the ROI, and it's all based on old historic data that really has no relevance for the future. How big is the market for the iPod before the iPod has been invented? Nobody knows, but we still make it up because we feel the need to have this plan rather than doing what human-centered design would encourage us to do is to accept that your business plan is always gonna be wrong. You know, like they say in the military, all plans become redundant the moment the first shot is fired. If you're truly interested in innovation, what you have to do is you have to create unknown data. And we'll go for some quick inspiration to an odd source, Donald Rumsfeld. You may love him, you may hate him, you may never even remember him. My undergrads certainly don't. Uh, but those of us who know him well enough, he got a lot of criticism for this phrase and it's critical, central to what uh, we're trying to do in human-centered design. He said, there are known things, things that we know. And then there, there are also known unknowns, the things that we know we don't know. But most importantly, there are unknown unknowns, the things that we don't even know we don't know. Now, we've got really great business systems for dealing with the things we know. That's called planning. We've got pretty good systems for dealing with the known unknowns, the things we know we're trying to do, like increasing our market share, incremental marketing, doing all sorts of things. But how much of our management time do we spend on the unknown unknowns? Truly getting out there and asking open-ended questions and trying to figure out what latent needs are emerging. So design thinking requires us to do these empathy interviews, to come up with prototypes, to test those prototypes, and then do a lot of trial and error, either pivot, perish, or persevere with each attempt. We don't think we're gonna get it right. In fact, we assume we're gonna get it wrong. We hope we're gonna get it wrong, because if we get it wrong, we'll learn. Examples of crappy prototypes. 
This was a surgical tool. You'll see on the left, it was originally made with a uh, dry erase marker and a clothes peg. And that was really important because they got that really fast. It cost a dollar. They got it into a surgeon's hand and the surgeon immediately went, oh, I don't use that with my right hand. I use this with my left hand, not my dominant hand. Oh my goodness, we just saved ourselves a million dollars in tooling costs by testing it with a crappy prototype before we spent all the money on a real one to find out we designed it for the wrong hand. This is another crappy prototype. I have actually no idea what this is for, but I thought it was a cute picture. <laughs> We're trying to design a better dog perhaps, but this came out of one of our workshops, a crappy prototype. You get it in the hand of the user and you say, how does this work? And they pick it up and they go, no, do it this way. It should be upside down and I would bend the leg that way. They're designing it for you. Get a crappy prototype into the hands of a user and they will help you design the product better. But it's not just for products. If we're in the service industry, we can do dialogues on post-it notes about how we check into a hotel. We could actually build out of polystyrene a fake cafe and actually bring actors in to actually order and see how we manage the queuing and how we manage the product complexity. And when we get it wrong, we just knock it down, cut up the cardboard and redesign it. Again, saving lots of time and money. Fail early, fail often in order to succeed faster. In software, how many of you have been involved with software? Billion, million dollar project, dare I say, SAP or, or Salesforce, that by the time it actually comes to your desk, it doesn't do anything that you wanted it to do. And yet, and they started coding on day one. Human-centered design says, no, get the design of the flow of the software on paper and post it and get it in front of the user and let them play and say, no, I want this dialogue box over here and this over here and let them do it in paper before we ever spend a dollar on coding. Brief example at St. Thomas before we end, we did this ourselves. And so we were sitting and we're as guilty as this as anyone. We were trying to come up with a better curriculum for undergrads and we were sitting in a conference room with a philosophy professor saying we need more philosophy and the dean saying we need more history and other people saying we need more math. And what we did was say, actually we're in the quad, why don't we go out and lay this curriculum along the sidewalk and actually ask students. And the students came along, we said, Take us through the flow of you starting on day one at the university and take us all the way through and tell us what your needs and concerns are. And guess what they told us? They actually told us, actually, we don't care about your curriculum. We trust you guys, your curriculum's fine. I'm away from home for the first time. I'm being feeling like I'm making life decisions that are irreversible, that cost tens of thousands of dollars, that are gonna put my family in debt. I'm scared. I don't know if I'm making the right decision. I need help, reassurance. I need a university that puts its arms around my shoulder and cares and loves me and guides me through that process. That's what my needs are. Curriculum? I trust you guys on that. So another example where we were designing for the wrong problem and we only discovered once we actually went out and talked directly to the user. Rule five, if you want to succeed at innovation, you have to learn to fail. This little cat's drop the bomb, run away. We often characterize that as disaster. It's not, because the purpose is surprises and the purpose is learning. Our biggest disasters are always our biggest learnings. And we really have to go into this with the mantra that every failure takes us a step forward in understanding. And so we need resilience as an organization and trust in order to do that. Fail early, fail often in order to succeed sooner. Or as Thomas Watson, founder of IBM said, the way to succeed is to double your failure rate. So in sum, five lessons of innovation. Don't ask your customers what they want, let them tell you what they need. Innov creativity is not the gift of a few. Everyone's born creative. Innovation is both an inspired art, but it's also a structured process, human-centered design. And facing uncertainty, don't plan better with more historical data. Focus on experimenting and creating new data with trial and error. Get comfortable with failing often and early. Very, one of the ways I always want us to be judged at St. Thomas by you is what can we do with this on Monday morning? This has been a very much a crash course, a, a quick insight into this. But I hope there's some things you can concretely do. Number one, go for lunch once a month with a customer or user with no agenda. Take a notebook every month and just ask them, what's top of your mind? What are you thinking about? 
What has surprised you? What has delighted you in the last month? You don't have to talk about our products, our delivery dates, none of that's on the agenda. Do it once a month for a year. You will be amazed what you find out. Practice empathic interviews when you take them for lunch. Say things like, really, Jackie, tell me more. Why so? Don't say, oh, we shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry, we'll fix it. Say, really, tell me more. Why so? Why did that happen? Why do you feel that way? Tell me a story about a great experience you've had with us. Or tell me a great story about a great experience you've had with another vendor. Tell me a story about a bad experience you've had. And when they start telling a story, don't interrupt them. Just keep saying, why so? Tell me more. And write it down. Use the online tools for human-centered design. Go to IDEO or Stanford, Business, or Stanford School of Design. They have put all of these materials for free. You can train yourself. It is fantastic. Um, there's a gift they've given to the world. So there's all these tools and examples you can get at IDEO and at Stanford. So please go and use those. Uh, we can give you reference to do that. Um, start with small solvable problems. Don't try to apply this to the biggest problem that you're struggling with. Start with something small, like how do we keep the refrigerator clean in our break room that everybody bitches about? If you can get a team of volunteers to help using, do some interviewing around the office and solve that problem, then you get buy-in. Then you get the volunteers, the enthusiastic volunteers that then you can go to your boss and say, hey, we solved this problem using this stuff we just learned from St. Thomas. Could I maybe go on a training course? Could I maybe get formally trained? Because if I get trained, I could come and train the rest of our team. And then you go and train your team. You don't need to hire consultants. And then last of all, Sign up for our course before we run out of space. Uh, I'm serious because uh, there is a lot of this that you can, do for free, you can do online, but a lot of this, wherever you get your training, you do need to get hands-on training. This, this is a, these are processes it's about doing. It's not about reading about it. It's not about um, you know, watching videos. You have to do this stuff. And so you know, get whatever training you can for some hands-on and you will be able to transfer that yourself. So I end with this final quote. We've got some time for some questions. This stuff is hard, but there is a wonderful benefit, which I've got my gift here. And I let it, you know, changing how we think, which is ultimately what human-centered design is really, really difficult and most rewarding. And I'll, I'll end with a, a quote that means a lot to me in this regard, which is, um, God answers sharp and sudden on some prayers and thrusts the thing we have prayed for in our face, a gauntlet with a gift in it. So when the gauntlet's thrown down in front of us, we have to work hard to learn these techniques. We have to be patient. We have to be, have uh, resilience. But there's a gift there at the end that we will get to. Um, and with that, I will end. All right. Well, let me uh, begin by thanking you, John, uh, Thank you. for a great crash course. Um, we're a little short on time. We do like to give you a few minutes to get to your meetings in passing. Um, however, uh, this link to this uh, program today will be sent out to all the folks that registered, as well as a link to some of the resources that John has mentioned. Um, so you will be seeing that. I am going to just ask one question okay. before we, we close down for the day, um, because it was asked several times. And it was, how can you encourage design thinking in an organization that appears to resist change? I've got the perfect example for you. So my wife and I uh, were teaching this at 3M. Can you imagine? We were asked to come in and teach innovation techniques at 3M, sort of intimidating. And we went along and it turned out they were really enthusiastic. We had the mid-level managers and they loved it. The senior managers who paid for this then came in at the end and there suddenly we got left out of the conversation. There was this huge friction with, as usual, middle managers saying, we want to do this, but the senior people won't let us. And the senior people were saying, we want you to do this, but you people won't step up. Now, I'm not picking on 3M because I hear that at our organization. I hear that in every organization. And do you know what the answer was? It went back and forth and back and forth until a woman stood up who was a senior middle-level manager who was a scientist, and she stood up and she said, you know what? I'm not waiting for a, a, for a corporate training program or a corporate initiative on this human-centered design. That's the last thing I need. We've already had one on safety and on quality. By the time it comes down to us, it'll be destroyed. I've realized I can use these tools and techniques within my own span of control, with my own budget, using an iPhone to take videos. Use, I can go and take a, have a lunch once a month with a customer with no agenda. I can do all that practically for free. I can do a little small scale project, get a result, write that up, and then I go to my boss and I say, this is what I've done with nothing. 
imagine what we could do if you fund us to get more training and to get more resources. So I think, you know, my bias, it's grassroots level. You take the initiative yourself. You know, bosses love results. This stuff delivers results. So get your team together, go with the volunteers in your team. Don't try to force anybody into this who's cynical. You force the people who want to learn, the people who want something new, the people who will stay after hours and do something extra. You do a pet project on the side, you get it in front of your boss, and then you ask for funding. And that's, that's the way I think we get progress. Perfect. What a great ending to the session. Um, just so you know, the program in design thinking, solving problems with design thinking is October 29th and October 30th. We'd love to see you there. And please remember, our last in our summer online learning series is Tuesday, August 20th on polarities with uh, Peter Krems. We will also be launching for the first time a fall online learning series. So if you can't make our next one, hopefully we'll see you this fall. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, John. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Hope to see you in the fall.